Ibrahim wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. So I wanted to pick up on the discussion <coughs> from last week and I'll, I'll share this, um, I'll actually go ahead and share it right now. It's a book by the same author of the, uh, of the previous halaqa where we were talking about Bidr al-Walidain, the, um, the rights of parents. And so this book <coughs> is called Maharim al-Lisan, The Prohibitions of the Tongue. And I'll use this as the, um, the, the series of halaqa, at least up until Ramadan. I think we have about five more sessions. And this book was actually uh, the, a book that I studied during Ramadan as well. Right before Ramadan, I was studying, at the time I was studying fiqh, like uh, sharia, sacred law, uh, the legal rulings. But then one of my shuyukh asked me, he said, Rami, what are you going to do during Ramadan? This is in West Africa and Mauritania. And I said, I'm going to continue studying. He said, no, Ramadan is a, is a time for introspection. Ramadan is a time to look inwards and to not just fast. You know, the, the goal is not fasting. It is a goal, but it's also a tool. The fasting is going to give us the strength that we can focus on other things. We know we get more we get more focused, we get more connected to the Qur'an, we get more connected to the masajid, we focus more on our ibadah, and it's the fasting that allows us to be able to do that. So the fasting at one level is a goal, is, a, um, is, the, is the ends, but in another aspect, the fasting is a means as well that we can work on other things, namely ourselves. So he said, I asked him, I said, what's your suggestion? And this is one of the, the adab of, uh, being with a, a, a teacher is that you look out for their suggestions. And this is whether we're studying the deen or even if we study the dunya. For those of us who went through public school here in the US and maybe in other countries as well, uh, and definitely in universities, they have academic counselors, right? Or when you go to the professor, uh, even within that subject, if you ask the professor, if he's a professor of anthropology, you're not going to come to him and say, hey, I studied this, 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 and this, let's have a conversation. What would be more proper, the edab, the etiquette, would be to say, uh, you are the expert in the field, what should I study? Any links, any books, any suggestions? What are your suggestions? So that's part of the edab of seeking knowledge is to ask the suggestion. So I asked my Sheikh Murabat Muhammad al Amin, what do you suggest? He said, have you studied the Maharim al Lisan, the prohibitions of the tongue? I said, I hadn't. He said, focus on that in Ramadan and memorization of the Quran. And so that's what happens in the school, uh, in the Mahdaras in West Africa. You will have people studying various subjects. They'll be studying usul, foundational understanding of where we derive the laws of Islam, uh, grammar, uh, nahu, there will be this, uh, sarf, morphology, tafsir, fiqh, all of these different subjects. But then in, in Ramadan, it all focuses on the Quran and purification of ourselves. And one of the main areas that we need to purify, especially in Ramadan, is our tongues. And work on making sure that just like we're not putting any food into our mouths during Ramadan, that we're not actually eating things or putting into our mouths, using our tongue, speech that is, that is improper. And we know um, there's even a, a, a hadith, and when I read this hadith, it was, it was very, very, it's very vivid, and it really impacted me. So the hadith is, there's two, there was two ladies amongst the Sahaba who had fasted, but they didn't have any food. And so one of the things that the Sahaba would do, if they needed food or money, what, where would they go? To the Prophet ﷺ. Because either he had something to give them, or he would encourage other people in the community to give them, or he would have something in Bayt al -Bal. But he was always the person who was giving. He was the most, he was the most uh, generous of people, and he was most generous during Ramadan. This wasn't during the month of Ramadan. They were fasting a nafila fast, and um, they came to him with a bowl. And they wanted some food to break their fast on. And he said, well, you've already eaten. I see the trace. They said, we're fasting. We haven't eaten anything. He said, then why do I see the traces of meat in between your teeth? So we know when we eat meat, sometimes the meat gets stuck in between our teeth. And they said, Wallahi, we have not eaten anything. We're coming to get food from you and we've been fasting. He said, but you spoke about so-and-so and you spoke about so-and-so. And actually, he actually told them in the, in, the, uh, in the bowl, he said, throw it up. And they threw up 
they started throwing up meat and they said we, we they did they were amazed too they didn't know when they were this where it came from and he said but didn't you before this before you came here you were talking about so and so and talking about so and so you were doing riba backbiting and he would know this sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he has wahi he has revelation like in the quran in surah uh, tahrim there was uh, the some of uh, two of his wives wanted to uh, or, or uh, it's a long story but um, they they made up a story and he was able to tell them the truth of what happened there and they said how do you know know this he said nabani al alim al khabir that that um, uh, i was given this the revelation so i know what is going on even if i wasn't there he is constantly getting revelation so he knew that these ladies what these sahabiyat had done which is also a reminder to us that even the greatest of people these are people who were companions of the prophet and about all of them including these two ladies what do we say about them radiallahu anhum may allah be pleased with them but even these the greatest of people sometimes they slip sometimes they trip sometimes they fall he's teaching us a lesson he's teaching them a lesson and it doesn't detract from their status completely so he told them he said you were talking about so and so and what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us in the Quran about ghiba that do you want to eat the flesh of your brother who's dead it's a very vivid picture it's not just eating the flesh so in English we even say backbiting right so it's eating the flesh of your brother who's dead and in the tafsir it says, it mentions that uh, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you know, he didn't just say, eat, it's, it's gross enough to eat the flesh of another person, cannibalism. Human beings where um, uh, uh, we have an aversion to it. And even in the extreme situations where it does happen, there's diseases that are occurred by uh, cannibalism. There's psychological uh, issues that are caused by people uh, who eat other human beings. Uh, even in times of needs like the soccer players who crashed in the Andes or the Donner party here in California they have psychological trauma because of that so um, the, the 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 ayah says do you want to eat the flesh of your dead brother so why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say dead why would you think like in addition to eat the flesh of your brother or sister for that matter if it's backbiting against a, a, a woman why would why does he say mayita why does he say dead Okay, because the person's not there physically. The meat is decaying. Okay, so it's grosser. So let's, let's think about this. Imagine you tried to eat the flesh of your living brother. What would happen? He would slap you. He's going to fight back. Right? There's, nobody's, man, what's, you know. In fact, the other day we were at the, uh, the aquarium, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And my daughter, she came up and she kind of like, you know, she snuck up on me and she, and she, she scared me. And I turned around and at first I didn't know it was her. And I said, oh, I'm glad it's you. You know, I, did, I thought I was going to have to get in a fight right here in the aquarium. You know, that's what human beings do. They're going to, you know, defend themselves. It's a natural, it's part of our, it's part of what's built into us. We're going to defend ourselves. And so if the person is dead, then they cannot defend themselves. So think about riba when we speak about another person. They, they're not there to defend themselves. They can, and just think about even in the, the human interactions, people will smile, we'll smile, and we'll talk with person, and as soon as they walk away, oh my goodness, let me tell you about that person. Well, why is that? Why is it that we're more inclined to speak about that person when they're not there? Well, there's a couple things. They can defend themselves. There's also the humanity of it, right? You see the person, how many times, think about a time that you were angry at a person, you're like, when I see that person, I'm going to tell them this, and I'm going to tell them this, and I'm going to go, you know, they're going to, and then you see them and you're like, you don't say those things, because when they're, when they're not there, you forget their humanity. And when you see them in person, it's, you know, you can, you can, this is a living human being. It's, it, the humanity is restored. And it's very interesting, like last week we were talking about narratives and stories and making sure that we're telling true stories and that we're not covering uh, truth with falsehood. Well, names is, very, very, is a very, very powerful um, element to, uh, uh, to, to humanity. I'll give you in, an, in another ayah, in this ayah, which is Surah Al-Hujarat. So Ramadan is a long month. We have work, kids have school. 
If you can't focus on learning all of the Quran, focus on Surah Al-Hujurat. Surah Al-Hujurat has a lot of the, it's the, the rooms or the, the, the chambers, it has a lot of focus on character and the, 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 the specific rulings about developing your character. So another su a name that the, that the surah goes by is Surah Al-Akhlaq, the, the chapter of character. And in there, in addition to saying, don't do ghiba, don't backbite, it also says, وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't call each other by nicknames. And this is not talking about nicknames that are for endearing a person. Like one time, Ali radiallahu anhu, he's married to the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Fatima al-Zahra radiallahu anha, and they both worked. And this is a reminder to us, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is instilling in people, even those closest to him, Fatima, who he said is a part of me. She's a part of me. He's instilling in her a strong work ethic because they needed income. So what did Fatima to Zahra do? What was her job? Does anybody know? She used to grind corn on the mills. And they still use them in, 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 in West Africa and Mauritania. Has anybody ever seen these? The two rocks? They'll be like the, the circle one. You can go even to here, in, uh, at least in Fremont, and I'm sure some of the other historical farms, if you ever take your kids to them, they have the old mills. So they'll take two stones and they'll have a place where they'll put the corn or whatever else and they'll turn the, they'll, they'll turn the stones. Uh, it's a very ancient technology and used up until very recently and in Mauritania they still use it. They, they take two stones, they, they, they etch out one side of it so it looks like a, a grinder and then there'll be a little hole to where they'll feed the corn into and then they'll have a, another uh, stick that they can put into another hole that's been drilled out and they'll turn it. Well, what do you think happens after hours and hours of milling uh, 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 milling the um, grains with that. Your, your hands are going to get callous. So that's what Fatima to Zahra, imagine this, the daughter of the messenger of Allah is doing this work. And then Ali, what is he doing in terms of his work? One of his many jobs, he was pulling water from, from the well. So here he is, you know, it's a, it's a strong work ethic. Well, the um, uh, Fatima had, had uh, told her, um, uh, or, or, or Ali had told Fatima, go ask your father and see if he can find us a servant. Give us a servant. So she told him that. And then Ali, and the Prophet ﷺ went to find Ali. And where did he find him? In the masjid. And when he found him in the masjid, he was laying down and he came up to him. And, and in the hadith, it's so clear. Ali says, he stood so close to me, I could feel the coolness of his feet. You know when you get close to somebody, if their skin is hot, you can feel it even before touching. Or if their skin is cool, you can start feeling the coolness. He said, I could feel the, the, the coolness of his feet. And then he called him, Ya Aba Turab, O father of dirt. Because he's lying down in the, in the masjid and it's a dirt floor. So he has dirt on his body. And then he tells him, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you something that's even better than a servant. And he said after every, um, you know, uh, to say SubhanAllah, and he gave him the, the dua of what to say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, and La ilaha illallah. Uh, sorry, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, um, uh, Wallahu Akbar. To say those, and then that would be better for them than to have a servant. So he's reinforcing to them again the strong work ethic. But the reason I mentioned this story, there's many benefits we can get from that story. But he called him endearingly Abu Turab, and then that actually became a. a a beloved nickname to him because it was given to him by the Prophet And we have this in our families. We have nicknames for maybe for our spouse, for our children, for our friends. Um, and so the Quran is not telling us don't do nicknames completely. The nicknames are the mockery nicknames. The nicknames that, and think about what it does. One of the first things that invading armies do, and this has been recorded more recently in this century, is they give names to the people that they've invaded. So the United States, we don't even have to mention the names. When they invaded the Vietnam, Vietnam what did they think about those names that they started calling the Vietnamese people? When they invaded the Muslim lands, Iraq and Afghanistan, as occupying forces, as invaders, what did they used to, does anybody, and I mean, that's our people, we can, uh, the, they're talking about us. Does anybody know the names they used to call people in Iraq or Afghanistan? The Muslims? Well, in addition to terrorists, it's actually, you know, which is another name, you know, that they all oh, hear, no, here's a terrorist. I've been called terrorist a couple times, once in Ramadan, on one of the streets. And I wanted to say something back to the person, but it was Ramadan, and if somebody picks a fight with you in Ramadan, what do you say? You know, I'm fasting. So what did I do? I waved at him. 
And Wallahi al Azim, you know what he did? He waved back. And it's almost it's like, it's like, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, like it worked. It actually works. He said, hey, man, you know, and used a, 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 a bad word. You know, he says, you know, you beep beep terrorist. And I looked at him, and I was in my car, and he was walking across the street. And, you know, if you're going to pick a fight with somebody and you're walking and somebody's in a 3,000 pound you know hunk of metal like that's not an even fight but anyway he said so I just I waved at him I didn't say anything I waved at him and he waved right back and it's like human nature like he just he didn't know you know oh hi how are you doing um, so yeah they call terrorist but what do they call the, the army the soldiers to the Muslims in those countries towel heads rag heads but they had some other ones too Mujis. In Afghanistan, they would call them Mujis, which they get it from Mujahideen. They'd also call them Hajis. Hajis. Now, what does that do? What, is, what it does is for the invading army, when they do that and they give them nicknames, this is no longer Beni Adam, a human being. Oh, that's just a Haji or a Muj or a terrorist or a towelhead or a raghead or whatever it is. It removes the humanity. So when Allah is telling us, subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He's telling us in the Quran, don't call people by nicknames, it's a very powerful lesson. It's don't remove people's humanities. They don't remove their humanity. And even for parents or, or teachers, one of the things now in modern parenting, what, they're, what, what they're, they, they tell people, and it, this reinforces for us, it's, it's the lesson in the Quran. They say, say a child does something, um, uh, does something. Do you say you're a bad child or what you did or your decision or your action was bad? Which one do you do? You talk about the decision. You talk about the action. Because once you, especially for a child, once you say something like, you know, you're bad for doing, like maybe in the parents, you know, they're tr they, what they mean is that action that you did right there, that was a bad decision and that was a bad action. But when, we say, when it translates into saying you're bad, in the child's mind, they, they're, they're, they're very absolutist. They're black and white thinkers. They can't think abstractly, especially even before 12 years old. Children have a hard time thinking abstractly. It's very concrete. So if, if a parent tells them you're bad, we're saying you're completely bad. So, it, so the, the, and, and what is that? In the process, when we say you're bad, you know, say his name is, you know, Ahmed. You know, you, he, he's no longer Ahmed. He's no longer a human being. He's no longer his son. All of these honorific titles of what he has. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. We have ennobled the son of Adam. Now he's, I'm bad. And so, so, so to me, when I, when, I, when I see that literature, I said, well, this Allah had told, told us that. Don't call people by nicknames. And it removes their humanity. So the same thing happens in riba when we backbite people. And that's what, when people start mocking the, uh, each other or, or other people, one of the first things they do is they start making names about them. They start, you know, they, they'll call them. There was actually one student in the school where I studied. Uh, this was very inappropriate, very haram for the students to have done. But the student came and, well, I'll tell you two stories. So once uh, a brother who, he heard about the school from West Africa from an article that myself and my friend Nabil Afifi wrote. And when he traveled to the school, uh, this brother was, his father is Libyan, his mother is Egyptian. He was born in Oklahoma, raised in, in, in Canada. So he has uh, a very diverse experience, but he spoke Arabic growing up. So he came to Mauritania knowing Arabic. When he's traveling through the desert, and it's really interesting, you know, to see the wildlife, they see a hawk. Now, hawk in Arabic is saqr or uh, baz. There's different names, you know, for hawks or falcons. And so the, the Mauritanian who was traveling with him, he said, Oh, atarifu hadha? Do you know what this is? Hadha usfur. This is a usfur. Well, what is a usfur in Arabic? It's a little bird, right? A little bird. And so he started cracking up because he, the Mauritania was trying to like, thought he didn't really speak Arabic. He was trying to explain it, like bring it down to him. Like a little kid, you might say, oh, that's a bird. Well, you don't say that's a little bird, you know, to, to an adult. It's like, that's a hawk. That's a predatory bird. It's, you know, a falcon, whatever it was. So, um, so then my friend, he started, for the rest of his stay there, he started calling the, the guy Osfur, bird. And the, kid, the guy liked it, because it was a kind of inside joke, you know, and said, so, hey, Osfur, how are you doing? So that was okay. But then there was another story where students were traveling into the vil village, and one had come into the village with a servant, with a person who was known as a khadim. 
And over there, actually in Mauritania, they, they, they use khadim to refer to uh, a woman who's like a female, a female servant, household servant and so forth. She happened to be in the group that came into the village. They noticed this student had come in with that person, so they started calling him khadim. And, that be, and he's like, I don't like that. But they called him that name so much, he actually left the school. So this is a school where they're studying Quran and Hadith and Fiqh and so forth. But the power of a nickname or, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's very, it, can, it can really affect a person. So, Ghiba takes away people's humanities, nicknames take pe away people's humanities. And in this story that I started off with, the two Sahabiyat, they regurgitated this meat, which was actually, it was like a physical manifestation of the spiritual, the spiritual interaction that had taken place. So when we do Ghiba, we're not actually eating the meat of another person, but spiritually, that's what we're doing. And in this situation, with other Sahaba around, the Sahaba were able to see a physical manifestation uh, as a miracle from the Prophet ﷺ of the spiritual interaction that they had. So it's very important for us to protect our tongues. And there's many hadith about the importance of protecting our tongues and being careful of our tongues um, and uh, it's, it's, the, it's the thing that gets us in trouble the most. And the thing that, that causes us that we're, we're quickest to, to make a mistake is our tongues. Um, it's even, it's, it's, we will make mistakes with our tongues quicker than with our eyes or even with our hearts. So when people, when we start thinking about uh, purifying our souls and purifying our hearts, before we even start looking at the root diseases, one of the main things that we need to get a hold of is the tongue. Is, is, in, is preserving the tongue. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this in many, many hadith. In a lot of the hadith collections, they'll have a section on the preservation of the tongue. If you go to Ihya Ulum al Deen, there's a, uh, the, the, the revival of the religious sciences by Imam Al Ghazali, there's a whole section just on the tongue. If you have that book, it's available online. Read through it during Ramadan. The Adhkar of Imam Al Nawawi. Imam Al Nawawi has a number of, of books, and I'll tell you a funny story about Imam Al Nawawi. Noah is the name of the town or the village where he's from in Iraq, uh, sorry, in uh, Syria. And so he's Noah. Noah. Well, there's another modern usage of the word Noah, which means what in Arabic? Nuclear. So there was an imam who was giving a khutbah in Arabic and he mentioned Al Imam al Nawawi. Imam Noah. The Imam, Yahya, and Noah, who's from the village of Noah. Uh, you know, he, that, that's, that's his, his title. So the translator said, and so the sheikh says, the nuclear imam, you know. <laughs> Sometimes things get lost in translation. Um, in fact, somebody recently, there was a hadith, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal kasal. There's a hadith the Prophet ﷺ taught, and somebody had run it through Google Translate, and it was just hilarious what, was, was, what Google Translate had, had come up with. But Imam Nawawi has a lot of different collections. He has the 40 Hadith, which most people are familiar with. If you don't have that book, get that book. It's a, the 40 Hadith collections. There's a Hadith, and it's a weak Hadith, that says if a person preserves or memorizes 40 Hadith, they will get a reward. I believe, I can't remember the exact, but they would have a, um, a reward of Jannah, or you know, there's a, a huge reward in that. The Hadith is da'if, is weak, but many scholars made action, did, uh, implemented this hadith, and so they would start collecting 40 hadith collections. So you'll find 40 hadith collections on sadaqah, 40 hadith collections on bidr walidain, re respecting the parents. Any of the topics that, that are addressed in our, in our faith, in our deen, you'll find 40 hadith collections about it. And people are still collecting those hadith. Like say, okay, let's just collect a, a 40 hadith collection. Recently, uh, Sheikh Tamim, the Imam at Masjid al Huda in Union City, he put together a book. It's called uh, 40 Hadith on the Prophet ﷺ dealing with tribulations. So, all of the hadith, you know, and just put them together. So, if a person is going through tribulations, it's good to read this collection. You can see oh, it gives you a good, comprehensive view of all of the hadith that talk about tribulations. But there's 40 hadith about preservation of the tongue, or 40 hadith. Well, Imam Nawawi, he says, I want to do a 40 hadith collection that basically, instead of summarizing subjects, summarizes Islam. So that was his goal with the 40 hadith, and that's why it's been so prolific, it's studied all over the ummah, that if somebody goes through the 40 hadith, 
you get a very good comprehensive overview of the teachings and the messages uh, and the message of Islam. That's why it's really good to have that book available. Now there, that there's these apps and so forth, you can download the apps. There's online commentaries of the 40 hadith. So the 40 hadith is good. Another book that Imam Nawawi has is the adhkar. All of the hadith that you say, you know, we have those little dhikr um, uh, collections, what to say when you come to the house, what to say when you leave the house on a trip. You know, usually they're little, little books, right? Imam Nawawi's book is thick, hundreds of pages. All of the hadith about what you say at this situation, what you say when there's a strong wind, what you say when the roosters crow, what you say when, you know, and, and very, very specific. It's called Kitab al-Adhkar, and alhamdulillah, it's been translated to English. So if you, um, uh, you want to get a book that gives you dhikrs to do at various points of your life, uh, that's a great uh, book to have. Well, in that section is a section on uh, the preservation of the tongue. So again, the point is that a lot of the books that they have are on preservation of the tongue. Just to mention some that Muhammad Malud mentions, um, that the Prophet wasallam he said that if a person preserves what's between his jaws, meaning his tongue, and what's between his thighs, meaning the privates, I will guarantee for you paradise. The two things. So those are the two areas that people get in trouble the most. What's between the thighs and what's between the, 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 the jaws. And even in this we see the, 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 the etiquette and the sophistication of the Prophet ﷺ that he didn't refer to things uh, sarih, um, like, um, what's a good word, like explicitly. So he said what's between the thighs. You know, we get the idea, but it's a very sophisticated way of saying it. And then he said, what's between the tongue? Recently, I conducted a, a nikah over last summer. And I was reviewing the, the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says that marriage is half of our deen. Right? It's half of our deen. And so we usually say it's half our deen, half our deen, half our deen. Well, what's the other half? Anybody know? What's that? Cleanliness, yes, there is, and there is that hadith as well too. And you can actually have multiple hadith that says cleanliness is half of faith, and marriage is half of faith, and we get a couple more. There's another one too. It's half of faith. Well, that's you can't have three halves or four halves. So it's it's just it's really to emphasize the importance of that. But in this hadith specifically that says marriage is half of faith, in the tafsir they say, oh, to understand this hadith, that marriage is half of faith, you have to know this other hadith that the Prophet ﷺ talked about, that whoever preserves for me what is between his jaws, meaning the tongue, and what's between his thighs, I guarantee for him paradise. So what does marriage preserve for us? What's between the thighs. So now the Prophet ﷺ said, you worked for that. You didn't go the haram route, you went the halal route. Now work, just preserve you know, the other half. And, um, uh, and it, it, subhanAllah, you can, you can see the, 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 the hikmah in, in understanding the wisdom of, of all of these hadith together. And uh, a number of times people, before they get married, they come up to me, they say, oh, I want to take a class on marriage in Islam and the rights and the responsibilities of marriage and the fiqh of marriage before I go into marriage. Well, the fiqh of marriage mostly deals with how to have the contract, what are the basics of a marriage in terms of what both have to do, and then divorce, custody, the basic things that most people don't deal with on a, a daily basis, right? You do the aqid, most people, one time in their life, maybe two. Um, most people don't deal with the divorce, the rules of divorce and custody. Some people do, and they're there for us to know them. But for most people, we don't, we don't run our marriages by the fiqh of marriage. So what I advise people is saying what really the majority of interaction between a husband and wife is, is, is communication. And that's really what, what tests us. You know, before we're married, uh, we, we have a certain way of interacting and communicating with other people. But once we're married, now we have somebody every day that we're having conversations with, that we're building a relationship with, that we have to, we have to compromise on certain uh, situations, we have to push back on certain situations, we have to learn how to communicate. Now you're forced to learn how to communicate. And so what I tell them, I said what's more important than learning the fiqh of marriage to prepare for marriage is to learn the rules, the sunnah, the, the Qur'an and sunnah teachings about how to preserve our tongue and what is proper, what is improper, and that's the, 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 the and then especially then once you have children as well. Um, so the Prophet said, whoever protects the two matters, um, also, 
he mentioned there's many a hadith about the harms of the tongue. There's one hadith that that's, I always think about. He said there, uh, the, that a person will speak a word, say something, not even give it a second thought, and it will drive him or her into the depths of Jahannam, the hellfire, a distance of a journey of 500 years. And that's for something we said, we didn't even give it thought, maybe it wasn't intentional. How many times have we, have we been hurt by somebody, they said something, and it was just in passing, and then we look back and the person, we're like, they don't even realize what they said. And here now, that pain stings us, and probably now if you think about it, it's, it's still stinging you, and that person doesn't even remember saying it. And there's sometimes that maybe we said something, maybe we said something to somebody, and this especially, you learn this lesson if you have kids, because our kids will remind us of things that we said, right? As, as parents, as dads, that we don't even remember saying, and they're like, and it, and it hurt them. So we really have to be careful of what we say, especially around our, uh, I mean, in, uh, uh, around anybody, but especially our, our family. So it's, it's very important uh, to purify. There's also a hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, أَيْسَرُ الْعِبَادَةِ samt." The easiest of worship is silence. So right now, the majority of people here, they're listening, you're not talking, right? And you could actually be getting reward for that when you don't talk, because your tongue has the ability to speak the haram, it also has the ability to speak the halal. Or just in not speaking the haram is a form of worship. But you have to consciously, you know, think about that. So it's not just, just by being silent, you, you get reward. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, actions are by their intentions. Well, silence is an action because you're keeping your mouth closed. But you have to have an intention. So if you, if you think, you know, if, like you sit down for a halaqa or you sit down, you know, for some quiet reflection and you say, you know what? I actually now have the ability to use my tongue for the haram, to speak the haram, but I'm consciously choosing not to. Now at that point, that, all, that silent session, you're getting reward for it. And what do you have to do? Nothing. It's easy. That's why the hadith says, أَيْسَرُ الْعِبَادَةِ samt." The easiest of worship is silence. So there's all these hadith about the harms of the tongue. There's many hadith about the, the benefits of, of, of silence. Um, many of the benefits that they mention, Muhammad Maulud mentions, he says there's, there's nine things, and I won't go, we're running out of time, but he says one of the benefits of silence, you give a break to your noble scribes. Kiram and Katibin, right? Every single one of us has two angels writing down our good deeds and writing down our evil deeds, and when we're silent, we give them a break. They don't have to, because uh, every word I'm saying is being written down. Every word, every action. And when we're silent, we give them a break. And the other thing is that when we say things or when we do things that are, that are foul or that are evil, that are haram, we're doing it in front of two noble angels that are sinless. Like think of the most righteous person, and I'm thinking about people that I've met in my life. Think about the most righteous person that you've ever met in your life. Just take a moment to think. That one person might be a man, might be a woman, might be a man and a woman. If it was a couple of people you're thinking, that most righteous person. Would you do some of the things that you have done? Would you do that in front of them? And think of two righteous people. Think of the two most righteous people that you've been around. When you get around them, don't they remind you to kind of like, they help us balance ourselves? Hassan al-Basri, Sayyid al-Tabi'een, the Sayyid of, of, the, of, the, of the next generation after the Sahaba, when he would walk into the marketplace and people would see him, do you know what they would do? They would say, Allahu Akbar, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Is it because they think he's Allah? No, of course not. But when they see a man of Allah, a person who's close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spiritually, he reminds them of Allah and then it causes them to say, Astaghfirullah. You know, it reminds them of, of Allah. And that's one of the signs of the people of Allah, that when you see them, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now imagine those two people, when they're in front of you, those people that remind you of Allah, would we do some of the things, would we say some of the things that we do in front of them? Most of us wouldn't, we, we all wouldn't. So they said, 
think about that, you have two righteous angels with you all the time. That when we do or say things, we're forcing them to witness what we do or say, and they have to actually write it down. So one of the benefits of, of, of silence is giving them a break. I'll end right there. We'll pick up next week. I won't be able to go through the entire text, but I've shared it with you. You can read through it. I also have some audio recordings of the entire text, but I'll try to, um, uh, to, begin, uh, to begin the series and just encourage us to, 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 read, um, uh, to read the ahadith about that, to start preparing for Ramadan by being conscious about our, our tongue. We know the ahadith where the Prophet wasallam said that in Ramadan, if a person leaves off food, but still talks about people, does ghiba, they've broken their fast. Now, it doesn't literally mean that they broke their fast, and this is important to know. So if somebody doesn't do ghiba, they're like, oh, well, I broke my fast, so bismillah, you know, let me just go ahead and eat. That's not what it means. It means the spiritual aspect of the fast has been broken, but we still have to keep the, the physical aspect of the, the fast. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq, to give us success, to prepare for Ramadan and to, uh, to, to, um, to welcome Ramadan, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at every month, when he would see the new moon, how many people saw the moon of Rajab? Did anybody notice the moon of Rajab the last couple of nights? When he would see the new moon, he would actually speak to the moon and make dua at that time. Allahumma ahillahu alayna bil amni wal iman wa salamati wal islam wa tawfiqi lima tuhib wa tarda rabbuna wa rabbuka Allah. Our Lord and your Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he would say, Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba bi shahri kada. Praise be to Allah who has taken away the previous month and he would name the month like now and brought to us this month Allahumma ballighna Ramadan Oh Allah make us reach Ramadan so at the beginning of each month he's reminding himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like we're preparing for Ramadan so we have these two months the blessed month of Rajab and then the blessed month of, uh, of uh, Sha'ban and then uh, to prepare for Ramadan and to, to start getting into the mode once when we do that Ramadan you know sometimes creeps up on us but if we start preparing, it's not just with the extra fast, but that's good. But it's to start being at the masjid more, reciting the Quran more, being aware of our actions more, thinking about our actions more. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq uh, to, to do what He pleases. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.